On this prequel episode, we've got our Little Women fan poll follow-up. We're learning about motion capture and previewing the Polar Express. Hello and welcome back to This Film is Lit, the podcast where we talk about movies that are based on books. On this prequel episode, as I mentioned, we've got a few things to cover. But first, as we always do, we have to thank our lovely patrons. We have one new patron this week coming in at the $5 Hugo Award winning level, which does give you access to our bonus content, which there will be a Little Women 2019 bonus episode out in the next week or two, probably this coming weekend. Our schedules are a little busy really, currently yeah we've got some <laughs> some work things going yeah. on and holidays and yes yeah, so we're, we're we're sorting that out but it will be out uh within the next week or so uh the 2019 sort of comparison uh of that movie so uh our hugo award winner is ian from wine country welcome ian from from wine country Take me to wine country <laughs> yes ian. we want to go indeed uh, so, uh, as always, we also have our Academy Award winning patrons, and they are Winchester's Forever, Kelly Napier, Gray Hightower, Eli Young, Scratch, Just Scratch, Shelby Says Black Lives and Trans Lives Matter, I Always Felt Disappointed That Joe Got Tied Down to a Man, and Alina Deletkolova. So thank you all very much. I, yeah, we talked about it a little bit in the episode about Joe mm-hmm. being ended up ending up with a man that at the time period at the time period would have been an indication of an unhappy, an unhappy ending, ending for her. If the story was written today, I think absolutely she probably would yes. not be paired off. That would at the probably end. make the most sense. Yeah. Um, and I would also, uh, I, I assume they're not going to make any major changes like that in sort of even like the 2019 version. Yeah, probably not. But we'll see. My guess would be that they, yeah, they don't make any kind of crazy changes like that. But yeah, it's a, I, that was my initial thought was that I, I, I felt the same way that it would have made more sense for her to not be down with somebody. But I, 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 I'm cool with the professor. He's fine. He's okay. <laughs> Let's go ahead and see what you all had to say about Little Women. Yeah. Well, you know that's just like uh, your opinion, man. All right, so we did get some feedback this time. Um, on Facebook, we had two votes for the book and none for the movie. <laughs> Those polls get buried. The polls, I yeah. There's some weird thing going on. <laughs> so strange. Anyways, um, we had comments. Yeah, though. we had comments. Um, Amanda said, your episode makes me want to give the book slash movie a second chance. Maybe as an adult, I will be able to see the character's perspectives from a more mature viewpoint. Still frustrated that Louisa May Alcott made the decision to not have Laurie and Joe end up together because she was annoyed with her readers' letters asking for it. Oh, is that we didn't talk about that at all. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll address that okay, in a second. Sorry. Overall, I'm going with the book because I like my own nuances assigned to the characters. Right. Okay, so um, the thing about uh, her being annoyed that people were asking like for them to end up together if they were going to end up together. That's always been like the thing that I've heard. I didn't include it in the prequel because I couldn't find a source like, like specifically yeah. confirming like that specific thing. Yeah. Um, but that's always been like what I've heard, like what people have said. Yeah. It's one of those things that I I would find it. I would be hard pressed to imagine that she would have said that, like she would have explicitly stated somewhere that that's why she Mm-hmm. made that decision even if it was so i would be it would be interesting to me how we would know that that was her reason for you know uh, what yeah. i mean because it, it would seem very strange to me for her to actually like say that out loud because it, it, it just seems like such a well everybody i mean i guess you could have said you know everybody i asked mean it, me. it could be something mentioned in like a, a diary entry yeah. or a letter at them that's yeah. often how we know things that's about true. historical figures but i i mean i couldn't because i looked for it yeah, because i had it. heard that and i yeah. couldn't confirm it so i didn't include it fair enough interesting interesting point what else we got um julie said the version of the book that i read as a child was a reader's digest condensed version i didn't realize until i reread the book as an adult and there was so much i didn't remember (laughs) honestly i liked the condensed version better bad librarian don't tell anyone I just did. Sorry. Uh, Still would pick the book over the movie, although I did love the movie and actually always preferred Gabriel Byrne to Christian Bale. There you go. 
And our final comment from Facebook. A condi- by the way, real quick, a condensed version of a book is such a strange thing to me. Yeah. Like, I, 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 I do those exist a lot? I feel yes. like that's not a, is it um, a common thing? It's not a common thing anymore. Oh, that's okay. It's like an older thing. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, okay. I guess that's interesting. I just never even had thought about it. Like a condensed um, It's kind of similar to like a junior version yeah yeah yeah. i'm sure you've seen like junior versions of classic novels true yes those yeah that that i've seen um Mm -hmm. yeah where it's just like pared down and edited for kids or what you know like Mm -hmm. just a younger audience and kind of makes it a little easier to digest but i I don't know i'm just i've never thought of or even think i don't think i've ever even seen a like an abridged i guess yeah i don't know interesting well they are easier to digest hence readers digest hey hey (laughs) So our final comment from Facebook is from my mom. <laughs> she has many feelings. <laughs> my mom this. did have many feelings about this. She was texting me about like all day while she was listening to our episode. She was texting me about our <laughs> our opinions on it. Um, and my mom said, "I read the book as a preteen because my mom told me that it was her favorite book, and my mom was not one to recommend books. Too busy raising children." I love the book very much and reread my favorite parts at least once a year. I wanted to be Joe, but also found Meg's love story very appealing. I also grew up in what I considered to be the ugly 70s and read a lot because our TV watching was very limited, and as a kid, I kind of wished I had been born in an earlier century. But I digress. I also really enjoy the movie, although Susan Sarandon's Marmee has always grated on me a bit. She was a little too progressive for the time, I think. I watch this version every year at Christmas time, and overall, I think it is a great adaptation. I would still choose the book over the movie. That is fairly typical for me. The life that my imagination gives to the characters is almost always better than the screen adaptations. Fantastic. Um, and yeah, we talked about uh, Marmee being... Yeah, she's she's a little she's updated for updated. the 90s. Yeah. Um probably more so than she would have been in yeah. the 1860s. Yes. Fantastic. Um uh, over on Twitter, we had five votes for the book and two for the movie. I'm not giving you guys a show the results option anymore because <laughs> everybody clicked on that one and it was not helpful to me. Yeah. And we, but we did get some feedback. Uh, Maria Meshkova at Rogue underscore uh, X109 said, I like the book more than this film, but Greta Gerwig's film I like Ooh. more than the novel. Can't wait for the special about it. Interesting. Yeah, that that interests me. <laughs> Kelly Napier at Stand By For Live said, I hovered over each option for a good little bit before deciding that I can't decide. I love the book. I remember reading it aloud with my mom years ago, a treasured memory of mine. I love the movie. It's my favorite of all the versions. Don't make me decide. (laughs) Don't make me decide. (laughs) Well, you clicked show me the results, I assume, so you didn't have to. (laughs) I'm working on those poll options. Twitter limits the number of characters I can put Ah. on them, so it's kind of tricky. Anyway, uh, Gray at Gray underscore Hightower said, I'm with Kelly on this one. I just can't decide. I have fond memories of both. The film has amazing design and performances, and I read the book because of a teacher that I really loved, so it's hard to choose. So you also picked (laughs) Show Me the Results. (laughs) Maybe. Maybe Both of you may have actually landed on something, but you didn't comment what it was, so I can only assume. Awesome. And over on Instagram, I did a new thing on Instagram this time, and I put, uh, they have an actual poll feature mm-hmm. that you can do in the stories, so I went ahead and did that, and we got pretty okay results, yeah. like more than we usually get on Instagram. Well, because the stories doesn't get buried. If you're following yeah. the person, it shows up. Yeah. I mean, it can get buried if they follow a ton of people, but like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's still going to show up, and then it's also really easy to, like, people will just click it, so... Um. And I, I I'll probably idea. start using the Instagram stories more often. I have heard tell that it helps, like, your SEO on Instagram. Or yeah. Maybe that's not the right term. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a real um, close enough If you, like, post stories right. frequently. Anyway, so on Instagram, we got eight votes for the book and six for the movie. Um, the movie was in the lead, like, for almost the entire time that that poll was up. Oh, wow. And then uh, the book pulled ahead. Got brigaded by end. book lovers yeah. at the end. 
And we did get a comment on Instagram. Um, Noel Ramirez said, so I've only seen the 2019 version and I tried to read the book before the episode, but it's pretty long and I'm a slow reader. It, it is pretty long. It's a, yeah, I gave myself a long time to read this book. Um, so I'll just give my thoughts on the movie. I think it's good. My criticisms holding me back are that Joe doesn't feel like she was the main character here. In the 2019 version, she was so realized that she feels like she was short-sighted here. Also, the Laurie and Amy plot felt so creepy here that I cringed when they got together, even though I knew they would. That's another thing the 2019 version mm. fixes. I'm excited for you all to talk about that version. I'm going to be jumping on Patreon to hear it. Are you Ian from Wine Country? I'm assuming not, <laughs> based on your name, but <laughs> maybe you are. Interesting. I, I am really looking forward to it then to see how mm -hmm. the 2019 yeah. version sort of tweaks tweaks some of those things. Yeah, I don't know I've, if I agree about the Joe thing necessarily. To me, she still very much feels like the main character. I think she feels like the main character, um, if only by virtue of that, like, we spend the most time following her. Yeah. I could see the argument that she's... And well, I'll know after I've seen the 2019 yeah, I, I was, version that maybe she's not as realized. And that's yeah, that was my I was going to caveat what I said when I say I disagree. Obviously, I haven't seen the 2019 one yet. So if you're comparing them, it's yeah, you could, it, it, you know, we'll see how I feel about it after I've seen both. I may agree with you then. So but to me, having only seen the 1994 one, she felt like the main character. Mm -hmm. But it yeah, if she's more sort of centralized in the 2019 version, it, I could feel like there there may be a, some dissonance there. So the book won out this time in our listener polls um, pretty handily, mm -hmm. 15 to 8. Yep. Yeah. That makes sense. To me, at least, I feel like, mm -hmm. even though you picked the movie. I knew I was doing a controversial everyone. thing. <laughs> I, at least everyone was, like, nice about yeah, it. Yeah, we didn't have anybody. Uh, <laughs> it's always a concern when you talk about media on the internet, on the internet yeah. that somebody's going to come out of the woodwork and be like, are you stupid? Yeah. We've cultivated a very understanding and yeah, engaging and fan have, base. Yes, I mean, if anything, it would be a very good fan base. It, it, the people who, if that happened, it would be some random passerby that would be more likely. But because yeah. I do always wonder if we would get because we do post the, especially on like Instagram. Yeah, we post like the book is better, the movie is better pictures, and that's one where I always wonder if one day we're gonna get a weird comment. But yeah, we haven't so far. I mean, our most controversial call to date based on like social media response was when you picked the movie of hitchhiker's guide oh, over yeah. the book yes that was very controversial it was controversial a lot to of myself. people were upset it's controversial to myself i still don't necessarily it's it's tough i i reasoned yeah. i explained why in the in the episode i I, it's one of my favorite books, if not my favorite book of all time. And, mm -hmm. I, and the movie is not one of my favorite movies. But still, I don't need to rehash it and get back into it. I think there are elements in the movie that elevate over that one thing, one to one. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't begrudge anybody for picking the book. I nearly did. All right, let's go ahead and learn some things. We're learning about motion capture animation. No matter what anybody tells you, Words and ideas can change the world. Well, more specifically, motion capture in general. So, much of this information was sourced from a Screen Crush article that I, uh, that I found that offers kind of a brief history of mocap in film. So, if you're interested in it, you can go. Um, I pulled a lot of the talking points and stuff from that. Motion capture, also known as mocap, is a process of recording the movement of objects or people. It's used in tons of fields uh, apart from film including the military, sports, medical applications, video games, and for robotics. Mm -hmm. uh, it's most widely known for film and video games, where actors are recorded, and then that information is used to animate digital characters. I'm going to kind of dumb it down, essentially boil this down. Uh, it boils down to the process of recording markers on an actor and then mapping those markers to the same points on a character, a digital and animated character's body. So if we put a ping pong ball on the actor's elbow, and then we track, use a camera to record their movement, and then we track the animated character's elbow to that ping pong ball, that's what you do. You do that dozens of times or hundreds of times across the, character, the actor's body, um, uh, you know, or whatever you're motion capturing, and you have a mocap performance. Mm -hmm. Get, oh. I always think of um, when I see footage of them doing mocap, it makes me think of like 
2D animation, like, live reference. Mm-hmm. Like, when you see, like, the older shots of, like, Disney animators, like, watching somebody dance or something and yes. then drawing. That's what we're going to talk about that of? a little bit more right here. So, uh, the early technology that would come to birth modern motion capture was used as early as the 19th century. Uh, when photographer Edward Mybridge, M- Mybridge studied the motion of humans and animals through stop-motion photography. Uh, the basic principles of this would soon serve filmmakers when Max Fleischer invented something called a rotoscope. And I think we've briefly discussed rotoscope yes. times before um, previously, but he invented that in 1915. Essentially, a camera would project a single frame onto an easel um, so that an animator could then draw over it, hmm. and then it would go frame by frame, and this would capture sort of realistic on-screen movement for characters. Uh, this technique was u- utilized in the, the 1938 Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And that's kind of what you're talking about. They yeah. would also watch... So, I mean, there's different ways. The, 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 this actual rotoscoping, rotoscoping um, was actually projecting the image, and they were essentially tracing it and right. then, like, embellishing it, yeah. basically. Whereas you were talking more about just sort of watching and refer- as a reference to yes, yeah. movement. Um, and then motion capture goes at even level beyond that, where it's getting the reference kind of like a rotoscope, but then using a computer to mm-hmm. overlay the digital character as opposed to drawing on top of it. I mean, you're still essentially doing the same thing, just digitally instead of... Mm-hmm manually and it's also not frame by frame i mean i guess it kind of is technically (laughs) everything's frame by frame to some extent i guess but so moving on to the motion capture we see utilized today i.e 3d computer animation as i was kind of talking about uh biomechanics organizations were making strides with the technology to monitor and track the human body's motions for medical research Uh, and those early advancements saw multiple cameras synced to a computer as they filmed a subject uh, and they would put either reflective or bright markers on the subject's uh, main points of motions, as I mentioned, like the elbow, wrist, knees, um, you know, hands, mm-hmm. it, all the different points that you kind of need places that move. Um, you don't need them, you know, in the middle of somebody's chest. You need like one, right, but you don't yeah. need a bunch because you're, you know, it all moves as one object. Uh, and that would help track the movements. Uh, this is when you think of traditionally, like you envision, you hear motion capture, you think of a person in like a black suit with little ping pong balls mm-hmm. glued all over them. Those ping pong balls are what the cameras are tracking. And the reason they put them in a black suit, uh, you know, in like a black room uh, with like white ping pong balls is that contrast makes it very easy to track mm-hmm. the objects. If they're computers have gotten good enough now that you can do it more subtly, it doesn't necessarily have to be quite so, you know, contrasty. But in, originally that was a, an easy way to do it. So motion capture has been used by the video game industry for a long time, kind of since they started. That's how they've gotten a lot of their performance performances. Um, and then special effects artist John Dykstra took notice of this and decided to apply it to Batman Forever to create a digital double for some of the actor's stunts. From there, James Cameron used motion capture uh, in somewhat small ways in Titanic. We'll talk more about James Cameron here shortly. <clears throat> Ridley Scott used it in Gladiator. And George Lucas famously used it to create Jar Jar Brinks. In the Star Wars prequels, uh, played by Ahmad Best, and he was actually, uh, you know, on set in a motion capture suit that they mm-hmm. recorded during the performances of the scenes, uh, and then they used this to create the digital rendering of Jar Jar Binks. And he's often cited, and it seems to be confirmed that he is the first fully mocapped character, like digital mocapped character in a film, like the entire performance. Yeah. Uh, going on from there, Andy Serkis's performance as Gollum is another example of an early fully motion-capped character. We talked about him, obviously, uh, a lot in Lord of the Rings episodes. Um, for those films, they were as- filmed. the scenes in the films with Gollum were filmed essentially three times. They would film the scene once with all of the actors, including Andy Serkis there, performing as Gollum. And then they would film the exact same scene with just, like, you know, Sam or and Frodo, mm-hmm. but but Andy Serkis wouldn't be there, but they'd go through the same thing so that they had like a clean version without Andy Serkis in the way. And then Andy Serkis would go to a studio with what a workshops and record the scene again by himself in a motion capture suit um, in the studio so that they could capture his performance. And then that was what they used to digitally insert into the the blank shots with Sam and Frodo that they shot originally. So they shot each of those scenes with <laughs> with Gollum <laughs> at least three times. Um to kind of composite everything together. Um, at the time, facial capture wasn't hadn't reached its maturity, uh, and animators actually recreated Circus's performance um, sort of manually, uh-huh. which we're going to get into here in a second, what facial capture is and how that's kind of changed things. Uh, in 2005, Peter Jackson made King Kong, uh, this remake of King Kong, and this utilized, again, Circus as the titular King Kong, uh, and it pioneered facial capture technology. Similar to motion capture, performance or facial capture, it's called both at different times, 
Um, I was usually referred to as performance capture because capture because it is capturing their performance beyond yeah. just their physical movements. Um, they place dozens of markers on the character's face or the actor's face and then capture them with a special camera that maps the corresponding points of an animated character's face to the actor's face. Uh, you've seen if you've seen any specials for any of the Hobbit movies, this is how they did um, Benedict Cumberbatch. And mm-hmm. I mean, uh, what's his name uh, in all the Marvel movies? Um Thanos, like when they see Josh mm-hmm. Brolin, uh, and t- tons of movies. You've seen plenty of, you know, videos of actors with little dots all over their face performing. And then, yeah, the digital character character gets mapped onto that. Uh, James Cameron's avatar was another milestone in performance capture because they used a virtual camera on set um, that essentially allowed James Cameron to see their performance on the characters in real time. So essentially mm. it was usually, you know, they would record it and then they'd go back and they'd spend hours putting it in and, and yeah. performing it. This had like a rough version that he was able to see the avatar characters, you know, in real time to sign out. Obviously it wouldn't look how it did in the movie, but at least a reference to kind of mm-hmm. see um, what it looks like. And I'm sure that's used more and more these days that's uh, like as computers get more impressive. An absolutely wild technology. <laughs> I mean, when like you think about you, it, yeah, if you think about it, well, yeah. And when you think about it, it's on your iPhone now. Yeah. You know, the little, those little emojis that you can like record your face yeah. saying something. That's what that is. Yeah. It's literally what that is. I never use those. They <laughs> I've creep, never they used creep it either. me out. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. The little thing where you can have it like do what, you know, say what you do or whatever. Like yeah. those little emoji things. That's, it's literally motion capping your face and they can do it. It's again, it's not as precise as when they put all the little dots on, but you can do it without the dots. They, it just takes essentially what, what that's doing is just taking reference points of like your eyes and your, like it's looking mm-hmm. for certain reference points that it's, it recognizes. Um, and again, it's not getting all the detail that you get, which is why you don't like its cheeks don't move exactly. The, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's kind of just going based on the mouth moving and opening the eyes moving, that sort of thing. Um, but it's the same premise. It's just a very simplified version of it. Uh, and so now motion capture is completely ubiquitous ubiquitous in the film industry. It's used in nearly every movie that involves CG as well as tons of other industries, including video games. Um, and there's actually a company, a startup here in Cape Girardeau, that's using uh, markerless motion capture uh, f- used in s- from cell phone video to analyze and improve sports performance, which is already a huge industry. Mm-hmm. There's tons of them, uh, companies that use motion capture to analyze like your baseball swing and then they take the baseball swing and some of them do require wearing special suits and stuff like that Mm -hmm. um this one uh company's called sports trace they use a specific software that basically maps the body without using markers it like looks at your hands and arms and stuff because again technology has gotten to that point but they're able to look at like the way your your baseball swing or your golf swing is and then um they're able to identify like where there are issues and correct it and that sort of thing mm-hmm. to kind of tweak your swing or your, you know, whatever, pick your sport. They have a million different uh, versions of it. But yeah, so motion capture is used for all kinds of stuff these days. So that is a little bit about motion capture, the history of motion capture, and the fact that it's taking over everything. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we're under 60. We were promised an oppressive cyberpunk yeah. dystopia, and here, we're getting we, here there. we are. We're getting there. Oh, well, oh, baby, we're here. <laughs> well, true. Yes, we're there. We're there. Sorry. We're there. It's just not, yeah. I was the promised fashion flying, is I not as cool as I was thinking cars it would in be. in my oppressive cyberpunk dystopian future. No, you weren't. Yes, I was. <laughs> All of them have Back to the Future, Two, uh, Blade Runner. All of these, they have flying cars. Eh, all right, we don't have flying. I'm just gonna go on record again as saying that the fashion is not nearly as yes. cool as I thought it was gonna be. Also, that that is also accurate. Very true. All right, let's go ahead and get some fun facts about the Polar Express book. On Christmas Eve, many years ago, I lay quietly in my bed. I did not rustle the sheets. I breathed slowly and silently. I was listening for a sound. A sound I was afraid I'd never hear. The Polar Express is a 1985 children's book written and published by Chris Van Alsberg, who achieved this film as lit (laughs) alum status very quickly. Quicker than anybody else, I think. (laughs) Yeah. Except maybe, I guess, arguably our uh, series yeah, authors, but not, it's yeah. not really the same not thing. The same thing. 
Um, so the book is set partially in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the author's hometown, um, and was in part inspired, inspired by Van Allsburg's memories of visiting the Herpelsheimers <laughs> and, and Wurzburg. Wurzburgs. Very German. Yeah, names. department stores. Um, Wurzburgs, probably. I've never heard of either of those, no, so those must, must be predate very me. Regional. Yeah. Uh, Van Allsburg has also stated that uh, Per Marquette 1225, which was formerly owned by State Michigan University, it's an old train, Mm -hmm. um, was the inspiration for the storyline. He said that he played on the engine as a child when it was on display and was inspired by the number 1225, which to him was 1225 Christmas. Wow. Um, he's also said that he was inspired by the mental image of a child wandering into the woods on a foggy night and wondering where a train was headed. Uh, for the Polar Express, Van Allsburg won the annual Caldecott Medal for illustration in 1986, which was his second. His first one, if you'll remember, was Jumanji. Yep. Uh, the Polar Express also appeared on the New York Times bestseller list in 1986. By 1989, a million copies had been sold, each year more than the last, and the book had made the bestseller list four years in a row. Wow. Of the book, the New York Times said the Polar Express is magic indeed, and Newsweek called it one of Van Allsburg's most treasured visions. Um, based on a 2007 online poll, the National Education Association listed the book as one of its teachers' top 100 books for children. Um, it was also one of the top 100 picture books of all time um, in a 2012 poll by School Library Journal. Um, and the book is now widely considered to be a classic Christmas story for young children. We, we read this book every year uh, yeah, at Christmas. Yeah, I read it as a kid all the time. Yeah. I mean, that was basically the only time it came out, but yeah. you know, Christmas time. Right. I mean, it's a Christmas book. Yeah. Um, of the book, American essayist Adam um, Gopnik. I believe so. Has said... Allsberg's mix of meticulousness and mysticism is his own, and his quiet Christmas bell, now rung, will never stop ringing. There you go. Fantastic. Let's go ahead and learn a little bit about the Polar Express film. Well, you coming? Where? Why, to the North Pole, of course. This is the Polar Express! Polar Express is a 2004 movie written and directed by Robert Zemeckis, uh, most known for Back to the Future's 1, 2, and 3, Forrest Gump, Contact, Castaway, a ton of other movies. Mm -hmm. Very prolific uh, director, producer, and writer. Um, The film stars Tom Hanks, Leslie Zemeckis, Eddie Deason, Nona Gay, Peter Scolari, Steven Tyler, and Michael Jeter. The movie opened October 30th, which is way earlier than I would have yeah, expected for... that seems a little weird. That's why I included the date, because I was like, man, that's... I mean, it's still the holiday season. I'm sure it ran through, but still, it seems early. Yeah, 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 that's I fair. would have thought, like, middle November would yeah. be when you would... You know, around Thanksgiving is when you'd maybe open this kind of movie. Because you want it in theaters for Thanksgiving, for sure. Right. I don't know. Just 30th seems early. Uh, it opened number two behind The Incredibles. It would go on to gross $313 million worldwide against a budget of $165 million. It appeared at number three on the highest grossing Christmas movies of all time at the U.S. box office list by Forbes after Home Alone and How the Grinch Stole Christmas, the Jim Carrey version. I don't know what year this list is from. There may be. Mm-hmm. I doubt there's anything recently um, that's topped those. Maybe L. Maybe Elf, yeah. I don't know if this was before or after. It didn't have a date attached to it or a year, so I don't know. The movie is 56% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes and has a 61% on Metacritic. The critical consensus on Rotten Tomatoes reads, Though the movie is visually stunning overall, the animation for the human characters isn't lifelike enough and the story is padded. Ebert gave the film four out of four stars and said, quote, there's a deeper, shivery tone instead of the mindless jolliness of the usual Christmas movie. 
and it has a haunting, magical quality. It's a little creepy, but not creepy in an unpleasant way, but in a sneaky, teasing way that lets you know eerie things could happen. The more I read Ebert's reviews of movies, the more I think he was a hack who just <laughs> I got lucky. I disagree almost every time with All his reviews, time. I feel like. I, I just routinely i'm like what is this guy on like wh- maybe that's why they released it before halloween they were like it's kind of scary spooky. it's <laughs> kind of spooky it could be could pull double duty halloween maybe, yeah. and christmas there you go you could be correct you could be correct but yeah i i don't know man ebert's reviews are again i don't i've never seen this movie mm-hmm. i may like it and may think it's good mm-hmm. he gave it four out of like he gave it literally the best review you can give yeah. it's wild to me i don't know which again critically consensus is not that his reviews are always so strange to me. I realized that I've never really like listened or read his reviews until we started doing this podcast. And every, almost every time I'm like, oh, okay, Ebert, whatever, man. <laughs> uh, Peter Travers of Rolling Stone, on the other hand, gave the film one out of four stars and called it, quote, a failed and lifeless experiment in which everything goes wrong, end quote. Wow. Stephanie Zacherik uh, of Salon gave it 1.5 out of five stars and said, quote, I could probably probably have tolerated the incessant jitteriness of the Polar Express if the look of it didn't give me the creeps. I have heard <laughs> that level that this as a criticism, yeah. that there's like a kind of an uncanny yes, valley yes, thing going like on. Yes, that's like the famous thing about, yeah. or the thing I've heard most about the movie. And it, you, when you see it, I, you know, mm-hmm. yes, I don't necessarily disagree. We'll see how much it bothers me when we watch it. But Apparently it didn't bother Ebert. Ebert so. didn't care, was into it. Uh, It was nominated for three Academy Awards uh, for sound editing, sound mixing, and best original song for Believe, which I believe is Josh Groban uh, performs it. Uh, The song did win a Grammy for best song written for a motion picture. Tom Hanks actually optioned the book in 1999 with the hope of playing the conductor and Santa Claus. One of the conditions of the sale was that the film not be animated. (laughs) Uh, Zemeckis said screw that though uh, Because he thought a live action version Would look awful and be impossible Uh, He thought it would rob audiences Of the art style of the book Now to be fair to him His goal wasn't that I think he's more leaning into the idea That there's a very specific look of the book Uh And he was going to do his best To recreate that And he couldn't do that in live action Um, Now whether or not he should have Or shouldn't have (laughs) I, I guess that's to judge um, he said also it would be cost way too much money to do live action. I, I don't know. I mean, Jumanji worked fine yeah. <laughs> live action um, and didn't cost a ton more money. Hmm. And I feel like there's equal amounts of like magical elements. Yeah. Ish, roughly. I don't know. I, I could just, be wrong. I guess you don't have here if Tom Hanks got the rights to the book from somebody else. Because yeah, it's I, kind of wild to me that. That's a 1999. That's more than a decade yeah. after the book was written. I didn't see. And usually, I, I mean, I especially didn't dive for on that. Yeah. Like after. I mean, he's already had a hit with Jumanji, not the movie yet. Oh, but, you mean the author? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I don't know. I, yeah, it is interesting that um, I, I didn't dive into deeper about the sort of the history. Wikipedia, where I pulled this this uh, fact about Hanks optioning the book. Mm-hmm. Didn't go into any extra details about Hmm. anything before that. That's crazy. The film is listed in the 2006 Guinness Book of World Records as the first all-digital capture film, uh, where all of the acted parts were done in digital motion capture. One of the things this allowed for, uh, actually, which is interesting, is that all of the children's roles were performed by adults, uh, and they used oversized props to get the movements to work right in the motion capture. But yeah, all of the children are played by adults. There are some elements of it, and we'll talk about it more, that other people are involved, the kids are involved. But mm. uh, in the scene where the engineer and the fireman are trying to grab the pin necessary for the train's throttle, I don't know what that means. Um, we'll <laughs> see during the <laughs> during the movie. Uh, but in the background of that scene, I was threw this in there so people could look out for it. Uh, there's a flux capacitor, a working flux capacitor mm. in the train. Uh, obviously, a little wink and a callback to Back to the Future, but also implies that the train is in fact a time machine. Uh, Three different actors play the role of Hero Boy, who does not have a name uh, in the book or the movie. Uh, Tom Hanks does the motion capturing and the adult voice. Daryl Zabara does the voice acting. And Josh Hutcherson Hutcherson actually did some additional motion motion capturing. So they did use Hmm. children because he was rather young at the time um, for certain elements of motion capture. But in general, uh, it was adults doing it. Uh, so when Hero Boy pulls the train whistle, he says, I've wanted to do that my whole life. Uh, and that's actually a callback, a reference to Back to the Future Part 3, uh, where Doc Brown 
that's the western one and he's on a train and he pulls the 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 whistle and says the same thing so there you go uh the locomotive in the movie as you mentioned is based on the pier marquette 1225 a restored steam locomotive located in owasso michigan uh, many of the film's train sound effects are recordings of the actual train hmm. and the train runs between owasso and nearby ashley during the holiday season they're shut down this year i looked at their website yeah but you can go and ride the polar express they can't call it that they call it the north pole express oh. for like branding <laughs> reasons <laughs> Uh, or something like that. It's, yeah, yeah, it's called like the North Pole Express. Um, but if you do some Googling, you can find it. Um, and yeah, if you're up there, you can ride the Polar Express. Uh, and this is the second film featuring, I thought this one was super random and weird. The second film featuring Tom Hanks singing Good King Wenceslas. The first time he sang it was in the car with Dan Aykroyd in Dragnet, 1987. That's one of those things. <laughs> yep, like, I had to include it. Cause like that meme of like... If I had a nickel for every time this happened, yeah. I'd have two nickels, have two nickels yeah. which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened <laughs> twice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's why I included that when I saw that in one of the fun facts lists. I was like, real? Okay, there you go. Tom Hanks singing Good King Wenceslas. All right, before we wrap this up, we're going to tell you where you can watch the Polar Express. Unfortunately, not super easy options this time. Uh, as always, check your local library, or if you still have a video, local video rental store, check with them. If you do have cable, YouTube TV, Dish, etc., you can probably record it. It plays yeah. on TV all the time right now. Like it was on the other night when I was flipping through, I saw it on YouTube TV. Um, so that might be the easiest way if you do have YouTube TV or something like that, you can just record it. Um, it is also available on pretty much every streaming service, but you have, if you have AMC plus mm -hmm. subscription, which I don't know what comes with that, like why you would have an AMC yeah. plus subscription, but if you do, this movie is included. So on Amazon and Hulu and all those different ones, um, or you can rent it for three ninety nine on Amazon, YouTube, Google play, et cetera, um, which is what we'll end up doing. So most likely, or maybe we can find it, um, recorded on, uh, cause we do have AMC on YouTube TV, I believe. Yeah. So maybe we can just find it. I, maybe it plays on a, only on AMC TV. I feel like it was on a different channel when I saw it the other day. But I don't, I don't know. know. Who knows? I'm sure they're not the only network with rights, but they just have the streaming rights or whatever. Who cares? That's the... <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter. That's the end of the prequel episode. Um, as always, you can do us a giant favor. Like we mentioned at the top, support us on Patreon. You can also follow us on uh, social media, Twitter, Instagram, Goodreads, Facebook, all those places. Just search for This Film Is Lit, uh, and you can, you know do the polls and see the pictures and all that sort of fun stuff you can also do us a giant favor heading over to itunes or stitcher wherever you listen to and download our fine show and leave us a five-star review it helps get us out there more and it's very helpful uh and that's it for this in one week's time we're talking about the polar express until that time guys gals non-binary everybody else keep reading books watching movies and, and keep, keep being awesome, awesome.